Hello and welcome to YF504, our final lecture. Um, thank you for your patience. I know many of you have been waiting for this to be up and I apologize for the lateness. Um, I've had some technical difficulties and I've recorded this a couple times, so hopefully this one works. Um, I'm also starting a full-time job this week, so all my worlds are colliding and, you know, you know how it goes. Um, so thank you for your patience. Um, today we are talking about challenges and opportunities in family ministry, which is sort of a quick wrap up. And then I'll also describe um, more about the final project, which I know many of you have questions about. If you have specific questions, please feel free to be in touch with me. Email is probably best, but if you want to talk on the phone or whatever, I can make time. So let's make sure that you're feeling confident about your final project. Um, but first, let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges and opportunities that are in family ministry. I'm going to kind of zip through because I think we have covered a lot and many of these will feel like review because we've done so much in our discussions and in the lectures. So the first sort of idea here is that integrating into the body some of the typical or maybe more stereotypical um, responses that we hear in the church are that the parents don't want it. Parents don't want uh, kids to be integrated into the body because this is my space, my time, that kind of thing. Um, the kids don't want it because, you know, kids think church is boring or whatever. And the adults are afraid of it because they don't know how to interact with kids. Now, whether or not there's truth to these um, or how true they are, we can see that they're definitely um, sort of the stereotypical responses that when churches start this idea of inclusion and integration of the whole body, that there, that's where the pushback usually is. There's also usually a discussion around parental influence versus the church. So either like in Deuteronomy 6 and Matthew 12 are kind of two scriptures that are used in this discussion. Um, Parental influence, meaning that parents are the primary disciplers of their children, and the church should come around parents and support them as the primary disciplers. And the church uh, side being that um, the church knows, you know, how to disciple people, and so let the church uh, take care of it, you know, let the professionals do their work kind of thing, um, and that the parents just kind of come along for the ride and support the church and what they're doing. So recognizing that kids actually need both parental influence and the church, and that ministry is a partnership and not a replacement. Um, I mean, every piece of research probably ever done uh, regarding parental influence shows that parents are the most influential person in the child's life, whether good, bad, or otherwise. So um, it's absolutely not necessary or a um, an option for us to think the church can be a replacement for parents and so the best situation is to be a partner with parents. Um, the best church practices bring families together instead of pulling families apart. And a family of families church takes intentionality which is something that we've been hashing out this whole quarter. A few ideas or keys to change. Um, start slow so it will be very tempting, especially if you're a driven type A personality, to go back to your church or your ministry and be like, this is what we need to do, you know, and start changing programs and throwing things out and implementing right away. And um, that usually is not the best case scenario for change in a church. Many churches are slow to uh, adopt change. And um, so it'll be very important to be very strategic about how you start to um, make some changes. You also want to enlist support first. So that means probably having a lot of, you know, grabbing coffee with people, talking through, what if, like, what do you think about this? You know, I, I read this book in this class and had some really interesting ideas, but I don't know, like, what do you think? Like those types of things so that people are sort of getting on board with some of the ideas and that, you know, you're not just like calling a church meeting and laying out, you know, the nine-step program for family ministry or whatever. Um, plan for the little things. So as you know from probably being in church land that um, little things can pop up, so be aware of those. Sometimes things that we think are no big deal end up being like a huge sticking point for people, so just be think 
thinking about that and thoughtful. Um, be calendar sensitive. So this is on many levels. Calendar sensitive for the family. So if, you know, um, many families in your congregation have kids that play sports on Thursday nights or something, um, be sensitive to that. So you don't want to compete with something that families are already committed to. Um, you also want to be calendar sensitive to the church calendar. So um, you don't want to start some sort of amazing family ministry program and then start fighting other departments for use of rooms and resources. Um, that is not going to turn out well. Um, commit before you start, meaning like this is a long-term uh, sort of shift. And so it's not something that you can just be like, well, we tried a couple programs, but it didn't work, so whatever. But really commit to what this looks like in the long term and have um, these um, values shape who you are as a church. You can always try something harebrained um, as an experiment. So a good way, I think, to introduce something new is to say, hey, a few of us were talking and we had this crazy idea. It might not work, who knows, but we're going to try it for like four weeks. So we'll have an experiment with this and just see what happens. And if at the end of four weeks we're like, this was the worst idea ever, we'll just laugh and be glad that we tried something new. And, you know, maybe we need to change some things or maybe it's like, wow, this is awesome. So sort of having a short time frame for an experiment is a little bit easier um, for people to embrace and making it kind of zany or <laughs> whatever your personality dictates. Um, would be helpful in sort of their embracing like, okay, this is kind of a crazy idea, but I guess we could try it or whatever. Um, and then finally, you can always take something old and make it new. So there are probably already areas in your church or your ministry where um, you are starting to do these things that we talked about in the course, this family of families. And so how can you sort of embrace those parts and, and make it sort of new but having that, you know, either if it's a tradition in the church or just something familiar that people can really um, sort of identify with and then sort of twisting it into um, more of this family of families idea that can be a good way to introduce change as well. Okay, so that concludes sort of some of the challenges and opportunities, um, which I didn't feel like needed a ton of attention because I think we've really gone through much of that in the course. And so now you have the opportunity to put all of this knowledge um, and just um, course work, the lectures, the readings, um, the discussions even, like we had some really good discussions. So um, now you're going to kind of piece that all together into a final project. And so the point of the final project is that um, you are demonstrating that you have um, a robust understanding of what a theological appropriate uh, family ministry looks like in a church setting. If you would like to use a different setting than a church, um, you just talk to me about that and we can figure out what that might look like. Um, but generally, because most of the coursework was focused in the church, it's easier to use a church. And so I'm going to walk through sort of the rubric um, to help you hopefully answer any questions that you might have. It is um, intentionally open-ended in some ways. So I hope that that gives you some flexibility in how you present your project. I know that for some of you that is very stressful <laughs> because you don't like the flexibility. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it kind of thing. So hopefully walking through this together will help um, ease some of that tension. Okay, so the purpose of this is to design a family ministry program or strategy, including but not limited to every issue covered by the lectures and the majority of those covered by the texts, including a section reflecting a strategic response to potentially divisive biases in a faith community. Okay, so that's a mouthful. But here's a way to structure it. Now, um, if it seems to you that the sections should be in different order, or maybe you want to combine a couple sections because you think you can knock out the things that you need to do, like that is all okay. 
Um, however, please be mindful of the areas in which I'm grading, um, which is based on, on these descriptions. So section one um, is description of the church community. So <clears throat> this is a fictitious church community. Um, it's always better to use a hypothetical situation than necessarily the one that you might be working in right now, or even maybe the one you're attending, because you can get really caught in the weeds on some things um, because you're so familiar with what's happening in your own context that you might lose sight of the bigger picture. And so sometimes what happens is that people really, really want to use their own church setting, and so they do, but then they sort of miss some of the larger themes because they get detailed in like, well, in our church, like this department doesn't really function like that, so then we have to do this and that and that, and then you kind of go on this rabbit trail that really has nothing to do with the course content. <clears throat> and so that's not really the point of this particular project. Now, when you implement it in your own church or whatever, that might be very valuable information. But for the purposes of this project, you are demonstrating that you understand, um, comprehend, can theologically think through the concepts that were presented in the course. And so that's a little bit different than wanting to have a long-term plan for your current church, if that makes sense. So the description of a church community is a fictitious um, church that after you've been at work, hard at work for like about five years, um, you know, talk about what that church looks like. So discuss sort of after you've been really hard at work at this family ministry strategy, what have been some of the outcomes? What have been some of the great things that reflect in the course, you know? And so whatever that might be in, in your mind, those are the things you want to talk about. You don't need to give a comprehensive demographic sort of explanation, but just give us enough information so that we know what's going on. So you can say, wow, ABC Church in, you know, small town USA or whatever um, has over the last five years, you know, um, gained um, an awareness and a strategy of family ministry in these ways. If you think it's important to say some of the demographics like the churches, you know, um, mostly an African-American community or the churches um, in, a, you know, a, a economically sort of surplus, you know, part of town or whatever the things are that you think are pertinent, but you don't need to go into like, you know, pie charts and stuff about the demographics of the neighborhood. Like this is just sort of an overall, what is the church like and what, you know, this is where you're sort of like bragging about what a great job you've done in the last five years leading this church into these amazing family ministry concepts. Okay, then um, the next section is sort of your biblical theology of family ministry. So who you are as the local expression of the body of Christ like is called to be. So kind of like what's your purpose? Like how is this theological perspective going to guide your planning, going to guide your strategy and thinking despite the context? So, um, you know, anywhere this could be applied. Um, you want to make sure that you include like a, a bunch of stuff from the course. So, and that is including um, something from each book read. So we want you to cite accordingly um, at least one citation from every book that was read. Most likely you'll have more than one, but at least one. Um, scripture that grounds and boundaries your understanding of the call of family ministry as defined in class. So you'll want to have, um, you know, some scriptural um, support for your biblical theology. And then historical practices, not necessarily history, but really like the historical structural setting that you had to start from in order to have like worked in, for the last five years. So you only need to explain your work um, and your strategic decisions and how you went from sort of what was to what is. So um, you could have something like the historical setting of the church had been um, that it was very hierarchical in its structure and the head pastor had a lot of power to make all decisions where the board or the elders or whatever, or deacons, however you know it's set up, is um, really just a stamp of approval, not really 
um, whatever. And then th that's where the, the sort of historical situation was and how, and that's where you had to start from and how you moved from, you know, that place to where you are now. And so it's really just hashing out um, the theological perspective that you have um, for the theology of family ministry. Then section three is starting to put things together. So given your context and your sort of theology, um, describe your contextually applied idea. So this is sort of like, here's my context, here's my theology, now here's what we did um, to kind of put those things together. So this is what you do in the broader sense of applying who you are. So just to talk a little bit more about section three, that could be um, the uh, strategic plans that you put in place. Um, that could be programmatic ideas. Um, that could be, you know, that to start, you had coffee with X, Y, and Z elders, and you um, invited, you know, um, some key leaders in the church to be on a committee that started sort of ex exploring what this might look like in your community. Um, whatever those sort of like first steps were to then, maybe then a year later, you started implementing some of the themes, you know, and whether that was through programmatic events or um, through, you know, teaching um, in your church. H however, you sort of go from the start of like, whoa, this is not a super strategic family ministry family of families church <laughs> to where you are five years from then when you're like, whoa, we're such a family of families church. You know, like what were the things, the strategic things that you did to apply that into getting to where you are today five years later? Okay, and then section four are like the programs and structures that you are currently offering or running that facilitate your idea. So this is sort of um, now taking the idea of what are you doing now in the five years later? So section three kind of gives you some ideas of what happened to like get you to where you are now. So what are you doing now that is continuing, um, you know, this great family of families church? And that might even say, you know, we've had so much success in this area in the last five years that, you know, here's what we're currently offering and here's our five-year plan moving forward of how we want to continue um, on this path or whatever. Um, and some of it might be, here's what we learned from trying this and that's why we do it this way now or whatever. So this is to kind of give an idea of what a sort of uh, robust uh, family of families type church might look like, including programs and structures. So that might mean your hierarchical um, staffing structure with a lot of power given to the head pastor, maybe that power over five years has diffused. And, you know, maybe there are some other ways that even the structure of the staffing has changed in light of this. Um, or even the structure of maybe church leadership, like lay leadership that are, are not on the paid staff. Or um, maybe that's what your worship services look like. Or um, the offerings that you have for um, different groups of the church. So whatever those things are. However you are going to implement those things is um, in section four is like the now, here's what's happening. A few things to remember, um, know your audience. So um, this is intended to be a document you can hand to a search committee or something you might offer as a consultant in doing a report on the current state of a church. So um, I say this part because I want to get you out of the space of how to fix my church right now. <laughs> But to think bigger, um, that if you were if you were to go to another church, like let's say someone said, "Wow, I hear you took you know this family ministry course, and you really have some great background on this. Can you come take a look and see what recommendations you might make for our church?" So, looking at it from that perspective, or you know, you're walking into an interview or something, and you know a lot about the church, and you kind of say, "Hey, here are some ideas that I might have in how to." Um, sort of grow this family ministry program or whatever. So sort of um, having that broader sense of the audience um, is going to be a more compelling 
uh, final project for the purposes of this course. Now you might be like, I would never hand this piece of paper to um, a search committee because it's like so academic or it's so whatever, I get it. But it's more like to give you an open-ended sense of, of what we want this to be <laughs> instead of, um, you know, your own sort of like experiences or um, your own church kind of thing. We've had a lot of really great reflection papers in this course, which I think is great. And of course, um, reflecting more is also appropriate, but we don't want the whole paper to be like about your own reflections, if that makes sense. Okay, so single spacing is appropriate and bullet points for specific issues you are highlighting are completely okay. So um, the page requirement is really flexible because if you're going to do mostly like single spaced um, then that's going to be a different amount of pages than if someone's doing maybe a lot of double spaced. Um, so it is flexible. You might even want to include pictures or graphs or whatever you think is appropriate to help convey your perspective. Um, it'd be great just use endnotes, not footnotes, and you can include a bibliography, please. Um, and you know, if you hand in like 10 pages of bullet points, that's probably not going to be the most effective way to communicate your understanding of the content of the course. So it's going to be like a mixture, you know, um, there might be some areas where you're writing paragraphs because that is the best way to communicate what you need to. And like I said, there might be some areas where you have bullet points or where you have, um, you know, uh, pictures or whatever the thing is that you feel like is appropriate. Um, so I want to just, I know this is the part where it's like, you might start freaking out because you're like, well, what if I turn in eight pages, but you really wanted 10 or whatever. Um, I think a good way is just to ask yourself, like, does this reflect my um, full understanding of the course content? And am I presenting that in a way um, that makes sense to the reader and can, um, can easily be sort of traced to say, I um, understand the content, I read the books and can apply them appropriately, I have a theological understanding of what family ministry is and how it can be applied to the whole church. Those are really the things that I'm looking for so that, um, you know, we have sort of evidence to see that you have um, interacted appropriately with the material and are able to um, communicate in a way that makes sense. Okay, so hopefully that helps. Um, you might be like, I'm more confused now than I was before. So as I said, please feel free to contact me if needed. And I look forward to reading your papers. It has been um, such a joy to be part of this course with you. And I just appreciate, I feel like everyone in this course um, was very professional and their academics was very, vulnerable in many of the discussions, and I just really appreciated that about this course. So thank you, and um, just kind of as an FYI, um, the course that you just took online is the same content that you would get if you had taken it at a Fuller campus, um, and it's the same coursework that Chap Clark teaches when he teaches this course, and so um, we worked kind of hard to make sure that it is very compatible in um, the content that you are receiving um, so that, you know, it is congruent with, um, especially those of you that are working towards um, different emphasis in youth, family, and culture, or however that works. So um, I think that's a really um, exciting distinction, actually, at Fuller, is that um, the course content really, at least in this course, and other, I think, YFC courses, works hard to be um, consistent. Okay, so thank you again and good luck on your papers and I look forward to reading them and hopefully our paths will cross again in the future.